Now to another topic, the effect of lone pair electrons on a molecule's shape. Methane, which has the formula CH4, ammonia, which is NH3, and water, H2O, and all these molecules are shown right here, they all have tetrahedral electron domain geometries. However, there's something unusual about these molecules' individual bond angles. In methane, each of the groups around it are completely equal. They're all hydrogens, and they all have a 109.5 degree bond angle, perfectly tetrahedral separating them. In ammonia, however, I have a slightly smaller bond angle between the hydrogens, 107. That means that there's a larger bond angle between the lone pairs up top and each of these hydrogens. In water, I have an even smaller bond angle, quite a bit less than 109.5. It's 104.5. That means that the bond angles between each of these separate lone pairs and the hydrogens and between each of these lone pairs themselves is a little bit larger than 109.5. So that begs the question, what do you think is happening here? I'll let you pause it and see if you can figure it out before we go on. So yes, as you might have guessed, lone pairs take up more room than atoms. Hence, lone pairs decrease the bond angles opposite to them. In other words, if I've got a big honking lone pair, it's going to push the other atoms a little bit down, so it increases the bond between the lone pair and the adjacent atoms, and decreases the bond angle between the atoms and each other. Hopefully that makes sense. Brings us to a wonderful problem. The three species NH2 minus, that has two lone pairs on the central nitrogen, NH3, which has one lone pair on the central nitrogen, and NH4 plus, which has zero lone pairs on the central nitrogen, have hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen bond angles of 105, 107, and 109 degrees, respectively. Explain this variation in their bond angles. And no, I'm not going to do it. I'll let you try it on your own. That takes us then to a different subject. As we discussed back in chapter 8, when there is a significant difference in electronegativity between two bonding atoms, their bond will be polar. The polarity of entire molecules, however, is a little bit more complicated. An entire molecule's polarity is a product of both the polarities and the geometries or shapes of all of the individual bonds in that molecule. So how do we determine if a molecule is polar or not? OK, the way we do it is we follow these steps. First, draw the molecule's Lewis structure. Second, as best you can, redraw the Lewis structure to show the molecule's overall molecular geometry or shape. Third, draw arrows between every atom in the molecule going from the less electronegative atom, A, or whatever atom it happens to be, to the more electronegative atom, B, in each bond, like this. And fourth, answer the truck question, which I'll explain momentarily by using a few different examples. In this problem set question, I ask you to predict whether each of the following molecules is polar or nonpolar. You're welcome to pause this uh, video right here and use the guidelines I just outlined to attempt it on your own first. After doing that, you can stay tuned, and I'll answer a couple of these that you're welcome to pay attention to. OK, this question asks us to predict whether each of the following molecules is going to be polar or nonpolar. I'm not going to do all of the ones from uh, the video, but I will do uh, I'll go ahead and do two of them. I'll do carbon tetrachloride, and then I will do, um, oh, what the heck, I'll do xenon tetrafluoride. So the first step in determining if a molecule as a whole is going to be polar or nonpolar is to draw its Lewis structure. Carbon has four valence electrons, uh, chlorine has seven. There are four individual chlorines, so I've got 32 total electrons to play with. I now put the carbon in the center, put each of the chlorines around the perimeter, and then I give everybody a full octet, that actually is going to be the Lewis structure for this molecule. The next thing that I do is I determine who, which of all of the atoms is more electronegative than which, and then I draw arrows going out from the less electronegative atoms to the more electronegative atoms. Chlorine is slightly more electronegative than carbon, so I'm going to go ahead and draw a little line going out from the carbon to each of the chlorines. The last thing that I do is the thing that seemed a little bit uh, nebulous when I was talking about earlier, and that is I asked myself the truck question. Here is the truck question. After I draw the loose structure and I have those arrows going out, I ask myself if carbon, the central atom, were a truck stuck in the mud, and these chlorines were all pulling on it, as drawn here, would the truck move? If the truck moves, then that molecule's polar. If the truck doesn't move, 
then it's nonpolar. This technique, by the way, is not one that I invented. It was one that was taught to me by my high school professor, Mr. Mullen. I dropped the last trimester of his class to, for social dance. I don't think he ever realized that I became a chemistry professor and owe my career uh, in a lot of ways to, uh, to his influence. Anyway, so um, if I look at this thing, you can imagine carbon being a truck stuck in the mud. I've got a chlorine pulling to the right, a chlorine pulling to the left. Those chlorines are equally strong relative to each other, so they cancel each other out. I've got a chlorine pulling up, a chlorine pulling down, same thing. They all cancel each other out. So would this truck move? So right and would truck move? The answer is no. So this molecule is nonpolar. Let's go ahead and do xenon uh, tetrafluoride. Xenon is a noble gas, and it's one of the few noble gases that has the ability to uh, bond with other atoms. So it has eight valence electrons, and each fluorine has four, or sorry, has seven valence electrons, and there are four of them. So I've got 28 plus uh, eight is 36 uh, electrons to play with. I go ahead and draw my xenon in the center, each of the fluorines out here, and then I put all of my lone pairs around here. Then I draw <clears throat> my remaining lone pairs. So right now I've expended 32 lone pairs, or sorry, sorry 32 electrons, I mean. Uh, I have four electrons left, so the only location where those four electrons can go is going to be up top and down bottom. That looks actually kind of ridiculous, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to imagine a set of lone pairs coming out of the board towards us, another set going away from the board, uh, or away from us into the board. This is an octahedral molecular or electron domain geometry. Uh, I'd like to show that to you in, in a model uh, right now. If you look at a model of this thing, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. If the xenon is right here in the dead center of this molecule, each of these bonds represents its bond to a fluorine, so you can kind of pretend there's a fluorine at each one, end of these. This is an electron uh, lone pair up top, another one down bottom. You could move these around. I could, for example, try and put the electron uh, lone pair over here. I don't think it's going to want to do that because that would require putting the two lone pairs closer to each other. So we're going to instead go back to our original structure like this. These bonds all going, coming out to the fluorines and these lone pairs being opposite to each other. In order to determine if a whole molecule is polar or nonpolar as a whole, we don't look at lone pairs and draw arrows to or away from them. We only draw arrows to or away from atoms. So I can basically, for the sake of this question, just erase those lone pairs and ignore them. Uh, fluorine is much more electronegative than xenon, so I'll go ahead and draw arrows out to each fluorine. And then I ask myself the truck question. If xenon were a truck stuck in the mud, and each of those fluorines were pulling it, would it move? So would truck move? And you can hopefully, hopefully see that the answer, I mean, I've got fluorine pulling to the right, another one pulling to the left, they cancel each other out. One pulling up, one pulling down, they cancel each other out. The answer is no, so this molecule would also be nonpolar.